Um, let's see. I actually came here on the Bangalore to Athens shuttle. I don't know how many of you have ridden that ride, but uh, it struck me, I was in India last week, obviously, um, that the digital natives, as I call them, the, that alpha generation that we heard about earlier, their experience with technology is going to be so different from ours. We're not going to see people struggling to get the music up and running. It will just happen for them. And so here I was on the plane flying here from Bangalore, and I, there were four or five kids playing with Apple iPads, those new tablets from Apple. I remember when I used to fly with my children, we had to bring a little suitcase with coloring books and dolls to entertain them on those long rides. Not these kids. They're growing up immersed in this technology, and that's how they're learning. And I was walking in the streets in Bangalore and Delhi last week, and the kids were also carrying tablets. These were 10 euro tablets. These are the ones that the India government made sure they got in the hands of every student. I don't know if you realize it, but 50% of that billion plus population in India is under 25. And they're going to make sure those digital natives are going to be able to use technology like no one has before. And there's a huge opportunity for all of us here in this society and Western and emerging societies to fix and reinvent almost every system. Because I think we all realize they're dysfunctional. Our transportation systems, our energy systems, our medical systems, our financial systems. To get creative, that is the opportunity to innovate. And I want to talk a little bit about that today and how we can start doing that here in Greece together. Of course, it's only appropriate to start with a quote from Socrates, one of the great Greeks. Only the extremely ignorant or the extremely intelligent can resist change. So what does that mean for the rest of us? We need to embrace change. And I want to talk to you about how quickly technology is changing, and I want to talk to you about how we can innovate on that technology, a few principles around innovation. So let's start and talk about technology change over the last 50 years. Let's start with uh, an example from Greece, the maritime industry, which has been a foundation of this economy. You go back thousands of years, those sh ships would sail from the ports in Athens using human power and wind power to lands far and wide. And today, cargo ships are equipped with computer rooms the size of what was used to put a man in the moon in NASA in the 60s. What's going on with all that computer power? Well, they can tell to an hour how long it will take that cargo ship to get anywhere in the world. And the cargo containers on that ship all have sensors now in them. So the people who own that product and goods in those containers know how hot or cold those containers are and how long it will take to unload them and get those pallets into warehouses. So the technology is impacting every industry today. So how did it get this way? What's happened over the last 60 years? It started with these mainframe computers that took up a room about as big as this auditorium. In fact, they were in what they called a glass house. Men in white lab coats took care of them. They had punch cards and reel-to-reel -reel tape to get information in and out of them. And over 20 years, those mainframe computers shrunk so they could fit under a desk or in a closet. And then in the 90s, we began to see them appear on everyone's desktop, the personal computer. And now those compute cycles have moving out of the businesses, out of the data centers, into the public networks, into what they call the cloud and the trade press. And those computers that were in desktops and even in our briefcase are now in our pockets. In fact, those smartphones are as powerful as some of the computers that were used to put a man on the moon. So where is it all going from here? It's going to what they call the Internet of Things. So what does that mean? In the next five to ten years, we'll see every building, every socket, every device that has a chip in it that costs more than 10 or 20 euros will be attached to a network. So the excitement I feel about the Internet going forward isn't about the three or four billion people that are going to be attached to it. But it's about what happens when you get a trillion devices online. And the opportunity then to really begin to change how we manage our energy grid, 
how we manage the information around us all the time, the personal information. What happens when you can take a smart pill and have it talk to a wireless Band-Aid and communicate with your doctor who may be halfway around the world, letting them know that the medication you're taking is either having the right or, God forbid, the wrong effect on your system. We're actually working with one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies right now on addressing that problem. So that's what happens in the personal. What happens in the business world right now? This is the innovator's dilemma for the global economy. We're facing more challenges and there are more books being written about innovation and change than ever before. One reason for that is most companies have taken out all the costs. There's no more money to be saved from the bottom line. So the opportunities going forward are about how we impact new ways of influencing our customers and our products to deliver new forms of value. Let's look at a few companies that have reinvented themselves already. If you grew up in the Nordic countries in the 50s or 60s, you would have galoshes and tires from a company called Nokia. Today, they're known for mobile phones. In India, one of the leaders is a company called Wipro, the West Indian product company. They were founded selling sunflower seed oil, and they are now one of the largest providers of IT expertise to the global workforce. So here are two examples of companies that have reinvented themselves and innovated already. The real challenge we're finding right now are the startups in the US, in Europe, and hopefully here in Greece. This company, Skype, that was founded by two Swedes in their apartment is fundamentally challenging the telecommunications industry, an industry that has spent literally billions on laying copper and fiber around the world so they can charge you for minutes of voice conversation. Now you can call almost anywhere in the world for free, thanks to these two Swedes. Or the movie industry, going down to the street corner to rent a video cassette. That will quickly become a thing of the past. Because of companies like Netflix that are delivering movies on demand to your TV, to your PC, to that mobile phone in your pocket fundamentally challenging the way we enjoy and consume information. So what concerns me through all of this is this stat, that 86% of the world's goods and services are being consumed by about less than one-fifth of the world population. How do we begin to change that? Where do we go? What does it mean if we can really turn this number around? I posit that there's never been a better time before in our society to start to create greater equality using technology, innovation, and creativity. I refer to this era as the decapitalization of technology. And what do I mean by that? Well, I knew a guy named Joe Krause. He founded a small company in the 90s that was one of the very first search engine companies called Excite. And Joe ran the numbers recently. He said today it would be 30 times cheaper for him to launch Excite than it was 15 years ago. So why is that? Let's see. Hardware is 100 times cheaper than it was 15 years ago. Software is free. You can go out and get world-class operating systems, application servers, web servers, database software being maintained by the open source community that's probably more reliable than some of the software you can buy from companies in the US today and around the world. And you have access to that global workforce. You're not limited to the people in your own neighborhood. You can go out to the open market and find the best talent that's available. And oh yeah, there's a little something called search engine marketing. You can target exactly the buyers you want to get to. All of this leads me to say, forget the venture capitalists. Become an entrepreneur. Embrace this era of decapitalization. You can be like this guy, Steve Demeanor. In 10 days, he wrote a little app in his bedroom called Trism. Paid 99 bucks to the Apple developer community. Over a few months, he made $250,000. Those kind of opportunities are everywhere today on the internet 
and in businesses and in our lives. What do we need to do to capitalize on those opportunities? We need to embrace these three principles of innovation, which I'm going to wrap up my talk with. The institutionalization of failure, the voice of the customer, and a culture of creativity. So let me start with the institutionalization of failure. Why is this so important? Because as someone already mentioned, you don't learn that much from your successes, but you learn from every failure. And the faster you can fail, the faster you can learn. So let's talk about that. I love this quote, an old Mexican proverb. It's not enough for a man to know how to ride. He must also know how to fall. There was a vice president at IBM who was given a $10 million budget for a project to shrink that mainframe. And he failed. And he went in with his letter of resignation to Tom Watson, the president of IBM at the time. He said, I, I humbly have to resign. Tom Watson took the letter, threw it away. The vice president was astonished. He said, I let you down. I wasted $10 million. Tom Watson said, no, I just gave you a $10 million education. Now go and apply it. <laughs> that vice president went on to be one of the people who really innovated on the personal computer motherboard, that board that is the foundation of every computer with the chips on it. So don't look at those failures as mistakes, but as important learning opportunities. Another great inventor, Thomas Edison, Turns out he had to try 10,000 times to get the light bulb to work. A newspaper reporter asked him once, how did you keep persevering? He said, actually, that was the best part, the 10,000 things I learned that didn't work. It was much more interesting, actually, figuring those out than inventing the light bulb. And one, unfortunately, if I can get it to work, that's impacting all of us, the mortgage crisis in the United States. This one is one that they'll be writing about in the history books for a long time. A million failures, and no one picked up on it. People were too greedy. People didn't want to see the writing on the wall. But the patterns were there. And let's not let that happen again, because we felt that repercussion throughout every country. The meltdown almost happened in the financial industry because of all the foreclosures in the real estate market. The voice of the customer. We need to listen for the things they're not asking for. We need to look at their unmet needs and their unarticulated needs. What do I mean by that? I love this example. This is an EKG machine that's no bigger than a textbook that's now being used in rural India to treat people who've never been inside of a hospital and give them world-class health care. Imagine being able to take this to some of the islands around Greece to people there who can't afford to get to doctors and hospitals. Or in Afghanistan, where it's actually life-threatening to carry a wallet with hard cash in it, working on converging the mobile phone system with the banking system so you can run transactions through your mobile phone. This one's closer to my backyard. In the US and urban areas, a lot of people don't want to own cars anymore. But car sharing sounds like a pretty unpleasant experience. But this company's figured out how to make it fun. Zip cars, wheels when you want them. What have they done? They've figured out the ecosystem of physical objects, of virtual objects and services. They've taken RFID technology, smart cards, web services, and they've actually put cars scattered throughout cities where they know there are young people and old people and middle-aged people who don't own cars but need them in grocery store parking lots and public garages and you can sign up and get a car for an hour or a day. So what did Henry Ford say when he was figuring out how to get cars on the production line? If I'd asked people what they wanted more of, they would have said faster horses. We don't need any faster horses. Finally, the culture of creativity. This is probably the best spokesman we have. 
This guy and Apple have disrupted at least four different industries to date. Let's see, the, the phone industry, the computer industry, the music industry, the print industry, soon television. We need creative leaders who are risk takers, who can motivate people, and who can innovate on ideas. But not only that, we need to start from the bottom up. We need to encourage the people on the shop floor, the people who are working every day with our customers to rethink how they can change the way we do business. Because they're the ones who understand the problems in our society and our businesses better than anyone else. A final example, this company Innocentive. This is an open marketplace for submitting your biggest and most difficult business challenges in an anonymous, anonymous way on the web for people to solve. And it's being used more and more every year now. So pharmaceutical companies, high-tech companies, manufacturing companies are all coming there. So what does this mean for Greece? It means you need to harness that infrastructure to couple the physical world and the virtual world with the brightest minds that you have to think through new services, new categories of businesses, new uses of technology, reach new audiences, and engender new behaviors. And I encourage each of you, take your smartphone, come visit me in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You can hold up the phone in Harvard Square and it will give you directions to my offices. You find your way there, I'll buy you a pint. We can talk about innovation. Thank you very much.